Welcome back to the realm of Buddhist audio bookshelf. Today marks our continuation through Dharma talks by Thanissaro Bhikkhu, Jeffrey Degriff. Engage deeper with these insightful teachings alongside us. Crafted meticulously by the team at Buddhist audio bookshelf, this audiobook serves to disseminate Buddha's wisdom. Your backing in proliferating these teachings is pivotal. Subscribe, like, and share to broaden the impact of these transformative messages. Let's collectively foster a world enriched by the profound guidance of Buddha. Relax and absorb, allowing these teachings' essence to resonate within as we traverse this enlightening path. Let's start with today's reading. Take care. November 25, 2003. People here in America are always telling one another to take care. When you say goodbye to someone you say, well, take care. You sign off a letter saying, take care. What does it mean, to take care? It's actually very close to what the Buddha had to say in his last words. Be heedful. If we interpret it in that way, take care is a really useful salutation. Often we interpret it to mean don't get yourself in danger in obvious ways. But there are lots of dangers that we create in ways that are not so obvious. What we do, what we say, and what we think have lots of repercussions. It's like throwing a stone into a pond. The ripples head off in all directions, and they bounce off of the shore and head back to create all sorts of interference patterns. Our actions are like that. Once you throw the stone into the pond you can't stop the ripples. Once you intentionally act in any way, once the action is done, the results are going to have to ripple out and ripple back. So that's the way in which you should take care. Be careful about the stones you throw. Be careful about what you say and what you do and what you think, because the ripple effect can go on for a long time, and in ways that you might not foresee. In fact, the Buddha said that the question of how kama gets worked out is so complex that if you tried to follow every little strand of influence you'd go crazy. But if you stick by the basic principle that the quality of your intention determines the sort of results you're going to get, you don't have to trace things out. You just keep focusing on the quality of your intention, right here, right now. Be careful of what you do, careful of what you say, and careful of what you think. As when you're sitting here meditating. Be very careful to stay with the breath. Be very careful to notice even the slightest hint that the mind is going to wander off. Catch it and come right back. The more sensitive you are to that potential, the more solid your concentration's going to be. The more solid your concentration, the more you can see. The two go together. So, as you're meditating, take care. And even when you get up from the meditation, take care again. We've been receiving some Dhamma magazines recently, and they show lots of evidence of carelessness. A chance remark that one teacher makes in a magazine can affect people's lives for a long time to come. It may strike them in a certain way, and then they think, gee, this must be the Dhamma. Then they take it to heart and live in line with it. They may be totally off, yet they have no way of knowing if they're not observant. Or you see some people quoting the Buddha and they're a little off in their quotes. Careless, sloppy. When they try to draw inferences from those sloppy quotes, then the telephone game sets in. A little switch here, a little consonant change there, a little vowel change, and all of the sudden the meaning gets totally screwed up. And then from that screwed up inference another can come, and then another and another, and the message gets further and further away from the truth. People assume that's what the Buddha taught. They can take it to heart and who knows what's going to happen as a result all kinds of strange things. There's an old Chinese teaching that if you mislead people in your teaching you're going to be blind the next time around. It's that serious. So, this is why in our daily life we should be very careful about what we say, what we do, what we think. It affects us, it affects the people around us. The more careful you are, the less damage you do. This relates to several qualities that the Buddha taught. Siddha, being intent on what you're doing, really paying attention. When you listen, pay attention, when you talk, pay attention. In other words, pay attention both to the things that come into the mind and to the things that go out, and exercise restraint. 
One of Ajahn Suet's most stinging ways of criticizing somebody was, this is a person who, as soon as something comes into his mind, it comes right out of his mouth. In other words, there's no filter, there's no quality control in what you do and what you say. This is because there's no quality control in what you pay attention to. That's why appropriate attention is so important. It's another part of being very careful. Noticing what's worth paying attention to and what's not. If you focus on the wrong kinds of things, they can give rise to anger, greed, delusion, and then the ripple effect goes rippling out. So, we're learning a very important skill here as we're meditating. Being very careful to stay with the breath, not letting the slightest thing pull us off, not letting the slightest thing interfere. This is precision work, because our well-being is precision work as well. After I'd been ordained a couple of years, Ajahn Fuang had me translate some Ajahn Lee. He said it was for the sake of my own meditation. One of the first questions I had for him was whether he wanted me to be literally accurate or to get the basic meaning, and he said, both. He wanted me to push the envelope both ways. Not to be too casual about throwing away the literal meaning, but not to obscure the deeper meaning, either. He once said that when Ajahn Lee gave sermons he would be speaking on three levels at once, and it was important to get all three levels in the translation. What this required was that I read Ajahn Lee a lot more carefully than I'd read him before, paying attention to the little phrases that I'd originally thought were little throwaway phrases, idiomatic, a peculiarity of Thai that didn't really have much meaning. I began to realize that in some cases there was a deeper meaning there. Then I had to learn to be sensitive to what was merely idiomatic and what was to be taken literally. That required sensitivity, and the sensitivity that I developed as a translator translated back into my meditation. So, as a mediator, whatever your jobs are, whether they're sitting here watching the breath or whatever you're doing, always take care to be precise to pay attention to the little details, because a lot of the details can have ripple effects if you're not careful. If you're careful they can also have a ripple effect in the right direction. Treat life as precision work. Treat the meditation as practice for the precision work, your laboratory for making your awareness more and more precise, developing the intensity of your intentness, so you really can sense the little things. That's one of the reasons why life in the monastery is kept to a very simple level. The interference patterns of a lot of different duties don't block each other, there are very few things that have to be done, so we learn how to do them precisely, do them well, even if they seem trivial or minor. The act of doing them is an opportunity to develop good qualities in the mind. So the intentness that you bring to all of your activities is a part of the practice. It helps your meditation, and the meditation helps the precision of your day-to-day -day life. If you put the two together, then everything that's a part of your life here at the monastery becomes a part of the practice, a part of the development of the mind. I noticed that Ajahn Fuang's best lay student meditators were the ones who took everything in their lives as a lesson for the practice. Living here at the monastery the principle holds even more so. So, whatever you do, take care. Just this breath. December 11, 2003. Don't tell yourself you've got a whole hour to sit here. Just tell yourself. You've got this breath. This breath coming in, this breath going out. That's all there is. This breath. As for the breaths for the rest of the hour, don't even think of them right now. Pay attention to them when they come. When they go, you're done with them. There's only this breath. Your meditation needs that kind of focus if you're going to see anything clearly. This attitude also helps to cut through a lot of the garbage at the beginning of the meditation. You may have experience from the past of how long it takes for the mind to settle down. But by now you should have a sense of where the mind goes when it settles down. Why can't you go there right now? Once you're there with the breath, and you can get your balance, try to maintain balance. Again, it's just this breath, this breath. See what you can do with this breath. Welcome it is an opportunity for making things better. How deep can it go, how good can it feel? How much of your attention can you give to it? 
Ordinarily, the mind is like a command post where you're receiving information from all directions about all sorts of different things, and it has a tendency to reserve some attention from what you're trying to focus on right now, in case an emergency comes up. But while you're meditating you want to bring all of your attention to the breath. Don't hold anything in reserve. If you find any part of your mind or body that's not connected with the breath, well, get it connected. Add it on. Let the connected parts build up as much as they can. With each breath. The more fully you can be in the present moment, the better. One moment of full attention is better than a whole hour of just drifting around. Of course, a whole hour of full attention is better than just one moment, but you can't do the whole hour at once. You can only do this moment, so give yourself fully to this moment. Don't hold anything back. In the text this quality is called siddha, intentness. It's one of the bases of success. It means giving the breath your full attention, not saving anything for the next breath. You give everything to just this breath. After all, as the Buddha says, how can you know how much longer you're going to live? There's the Sutta where he asks the monks, how often do you remind yourself of death every day? One monk responds, I remind myself that if I had one more day to live, I could do an awful lot in terms of the practice. Another monk says, I tell myself that if I had half a day left to live, I could do an awful lot in terms of the practice, and so it goes on down to shorter and shorter intervals of time, until finally one monk says, I keep telling myself. If I had one more breath to live I could do a lot in terms of the practice. And the Buddha says, the last monk is the one who's not complacent. Everyone else, he said, counts as heedless and complacent. What this means is that in one breath you've got everything you need to focus on, everything you need to do a lot in terms of the practice. If we let our practice get automatic without giving it our full attention, then this breath comes and that breath goes, and all without our getting much out of any of them, thinking somehow that the number of breaths can make up for the fact that we didn't really pay attention to any one particular breath very much. It's like presenting an argument. Some people think that 50 weak arguments add up to one strong argument, or that 50 poor reasons for something add up to one good reason, but they don't. All you need is one really good reason, one really good argument that goes straight to the jugular, and you win the day. It's the same with the meditation. All you need is one really good breath, one intently experienced breath, one fully experienced breath. That can show you a lot more than an hour or two of superficially viewed breaths breaths where you're just skimming across the surface, hoping to get through all this breathing to the end of the hour. So try to immerse yourself in the breath. The word kagadasati means mindfulness immersed in the body. The gada there is a suffix meaning immersed. Try to surround yourself totally with the breath. Be aware of the breath on all sides. That way you don't have room to hold anything back. Things begin to open up in the body, things begin to open up in the mind. Sometimes, you can begin to detect an actual physical sense that you've been pulling yourself back somehow from your body, or that you're doing it now. Pulling yourself back from being totally immersed in the present moment, saving a part of yourself for something else. Well, as you're meditating, let go of that sense of pulling back. Let yourself jump right into the present moment the same way you jump into a big pool of water. Everything you need to know for the purpose of awakening is right here, and if you hold back it, that means you're missing some of the elements. So as far as you're concerned right here, right now, this is all there is. The right here, the right now this breath, this breath. If you see any thoughts arising in the mind about how much longer we're going to be sitting here or how long we have been sitting here, just let them blow away. Think of the breath as going right through them. Not giving them any space to land. You'll find, as you stay fully immersed in the breath like this, that a lot of the good qualities you want to develop in the practice come along without your having to think about them. You don't have to worry about directed thought. You don't have to worry about evaluation, you don't have to worry about all those wings to awakening. As you fully give yourself to the breath, fully give yourself to the present moment, they all come together. Luang Pa Phut once told of the time he was studying with Ajahn Sao. 
Ajahn Sao's meditation instructions were simplicity itself. Just focus on the meditation word he said, that's all you have to know. Don't ask what it means, don't ask where it's going to take you. Just focus on the one word, but oh. Luang Pa Phat, being the sort of person who liked to read a lot, would read Ajahn Singh's meditation guide, which talks about establishing mindfulness and all the other steps you have to go through to get into your meditation. So he asked Ajahn Sao about this, and Ajahn Sao said, look, when you focus on the butto, all those other steps happen of their own accord without your having to decide where mindfulness is and where you have to establish it. If you allow yourself to focus fully on the butto, all those other qualities come along as well. The same holds true in being with the breath. Fully give yourself to the breath. If you want to say a meditation word along with it, think of every little cell in your body saying butto, butto until the mind is really there with the breath. Then you can let go of the word and just be with the breath. Don't pull out, don't pull back, just stay right here. Bit by bit you'll find yourself adjusting to staying right here comfortably. That's the directed thought, that's the evaluation. But you don't have to give those processes those names. Just be right here, be aware right here, be comfortable right here, and the fullness of your awareness will develop over time without your having to plan ahead, without your having to pace yourself. Give yourself fully right now. If you give yourself fully right now and if it grows fuller in the course of time, fine. If not, you've done everything you can, so there's no need to worry about it. You don't have to ask yourself where you are in the grand arc of the hour. You don't have to save yourself for the last lap. It's not like being a runner who has to pace himself. You give yourself fully to the breath right now, right now, and don't have to worry about what you're going to have left at the end of the hour. The full giving right now is what's going to see you through the hour. So, as you're meditating here, there's just this one thing. This breath. That's all you need to know. Laying the infrastructure. January 12, 2004. Try to be as sensitive as possible to the breath. Get down to the details of the breath, because the more sensitive you are to this one thing, the more you develop the quality of discernment that we're aiming at and keep your eyes on the road. In other words, don't anticipate where you're going to go with this. Just keep following the steps, step by step, and the causes will take care of the results. It's not the case that by imagining results you're going to get the causes to go in that direction. If that were the case, right imagination would be one of the steps on the path. But it's not. What you want to do is develop the path, develop right view so come to be developed. And where do you find the things to be developed? They're right here, right in front of your nose. That's where the work is to be done not in your anticipation of where you're going to go, but in paying really close attention to the breath right here and now. This is your path. If you spend all your time looking off to the horizon to see the big mountain we're headed to, you lose sight of where you're going and drive off the side of the road or crash into somebody and you never get there. It's by following the path that the path develops. It's by focusing your attention of the breath getting really, really sensitive right here that your sensitivity is going to take you where you want to go. Because the sensitivity involves not only very clear perception, but also continuity. If you really want to be sensitive to something, you've got to watch it continuously and not go skipping around. Think of a needle on a record. When the needle stays in the groove, you hear the music on the record. If the needle goes jumping around, then all you get are screeches and scratches, and they don't make any sense at all. And it certainly isn't music. It's by staying in the groove and by following each little squiggle that the record player delivers the music. So be very sensitive to the little squiggles in your breath. Keep tabs on this one level of your awareness. As you get more sensitive to the present moment, you begin to notice that there are lots of different things you could focus on, and your ability to stay focused on this one thing in the midst of everything else is. What makes the difference? It's not like you're trying to blot out or be oblivious to those other things. It's simply that you keep track of this one level of awareness, this one level of sensation that you've got right here. It's like a radio tuning into a station.
the radio waves for all the stations in the San Diego and Los Angeles area are coming through this room right now, but when you have a radio you choose which one you want to listen to. The rest are still going through the radio, but you don't tune into them. So try to stay tuned into the breath and resist the temptation to go wandering after other things. And you'll find all kinds of things to distract you. Some of them are obvious, like the chattering going through your mind. You don't have to do anything with that chatter. Just make sure that the main member of your committee is right here. As for the other members of the committee, they can be off in the corner talking about whatever they want to, but you don't have to silence them. If you don't pay attention to them, after a while they'll fall silent on their own. Otherwise, if you keep running back and forth between the breath and trying to stop this thought and stop that thought, the breath gets abandoned, and so. Instead of being concentrated on the breath, you find yourself running around. There's a children's game I saw once in a department store in Japan. In the department stores there they have game arcades up on the top floor, where the children can play while their mothers are shopping. One of the games depicted a set of holes in the ground out in the American prairie. Every now and then a plastic prairie dog would pop up out of one of the holes, and you were given a plastic mallet to hit the prairie dog on the head. And of course you spend your time crazy with all these prairie dogs popping up here, popping up there. Kids loved it, of course, but it wasn't a concentration-inducing game. So don't go out hitting all the prairie dogs on the head. Stay right here with your breath. The prairie dogs will pop up from one hole and then another hole, and then they'll go away, and they'll pop up again and then go away again, but you don't have to go around hitting them. Just stay with this one focus on the breath. There'll be other distractions, too. There'll be pains in the body here and there, but you don't have to focus on them. Try to make the breath as comfortable as possible. You can let the pain have whichever part of the body it's going to have. You don't have to get involved. As you're working on the comfortable breath at one spot, eventually you'll be able to spread the comfortable breath energy from that spot out throughout the body, right through the pain. That will help take away a lot of the discomfort, a lot of the tension, a lot of the sense that you can't stand it. But in order to do that you've got to work on your foundation right here. So, again, stay with the breath. Feelings of energy, rapture will come up sometimes. Again, stay with the breath. You know the feeling of energy and rapture is there, but you don't have to get involved with it. You can't take that as your object. You have to stay with. The breath is your object all the time. Some people say that once the mind begins to settle down, you drop the breath and stay with the feeling of mental pleasure. Well, if you do that you've abandoned your foundation and you can easily get lost wandering off someplace else. You want to stay right here with the breath. Whether the things that come up in the body strike you as good or bad, you stay with the breath as your foundation. As Ajahn Fuang once said, this is the basis for all of our skills. Don't abandon the basis. If the energy gets too strong, just think of it going out the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet. Don't try to hold it in. That way you find it easier actually to stay with the breath and to get to a more refined level of breathing, a more refined sense of the body. Visions may come up. You may see light. You may actually see faces or events and those may be signs that your mind is beginning to settle down. But think of driving down a road. When you drive down the road and see a sign that says, entering valley center you don't get up and drive on the sign. You stay on the road. Whatever comes up in the meditation, especially as the mind begins to settle down and distorts its sensation of the body, sometimes the body feels really big, sometimes really small you know that that's happening, but you don't make it your focus. You keep your focus on the sensation of the breathing, because what you want to do here is to develop a really strong foundation. All kinds of things can come up in the meditation, and if you don't have a foundation, they can knock you away. Not just the obvious distractions, like distracted thinking. Any of the obstacles some of the seemingly positive things that are signs that the mind is beginning to settle down or things that happen in the body or the mind as the mind begins to settle down. You don't want them to distract you, either. 
you're working on your ability to stick with one thing no matter what else happens. And again, it's not that you're denying the experience of those other things. It's simply that you're able to maintain your focus in the midst of all the activity around you. This is the ability that will give rise to discernment. This ability to stay right here with your foundation. You begin to see thoughts come and go as if you were watching them from outside. It used to be that you would take on those thoughts almost like a coat that was handed to you. You put on the coat and it became your coat. You were inside it. But this time, instead of taking it on, you sit very still and watch the thought come, watch it go, so that it doesn't take over the mind. Any thoughts of boredom, impatience, or anticipation about what this is going to be, what that's going to be, sudden insights that spring up in the mind. You have to watch out for those, too. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're false. It's like what the tracking books fox walking. You don't place the weight on your forward foot until you really know that your forward foot is in a good place to support your weight. So you try to keep your weight on the back foot, where you already are. You stay with the breath. Whatever comes up, you watch it. And only if it looks like a good thing to follow, then you try. But even then you have to be very careful. The best thing, especially in the beginning, is to regard everything aside from the breath as someplace you don't want to go, and that way you can maintain your foundation. We tend to think of insight practice and concentration practice as two separate things. But where does the insight practice come from if it doesn't have this good foundation of stillness? After all, it's only when you're still that you can see subtle things move. So the time spent on concentration, being very careful to watch this very mundane thing, the breath coming in, going out, getting familiar with it, getting to have a sense of being at home with it, getting it to be comfortable is not wasted time. It's time spent working on your foundation. Remember that the taller buildings require deeper foundations, and you're here working on a building that's really tall. So you've got to dig down deeply into the bedrock, so that when the time does come to build that building, it's not going to fall over. Only when the mind is really still can it really see. Only when. It has a solid unwavering foundation in the breath can it see other things moving in the mind. It's like running a very subtle experiment that requires very precise measurements. You want to make sure that the building you're in has a solid foundation, the table on which the instruments are placed is solid and not liable to rock. Only when everything is solidly based can you trust the measurements. But if the table wobbles or if the building doesn't really have a good foundation, then no matter how precise your equipment, you can't trust the results of the experiment. You can't trust the measurements, because all you may be measuring is just the wobbling of the table or the settling of the building. So stay right here. Only by burrowing into this point, really getting sensitive to what's going on at this point, can you gain insight. Remember the three knowledges the Buddha gained on the night of his awakening. The first knowledge was about his own past lives. The second knowledge was about the dying and rebirth of all the beings in the cosmos. Those weren't the knowledges that gave him awakening, though. They pointed him in the right direction, because the second knowledge pointed to the question of kama, of views and intentions. The actions of beings, the views under which they acted. This is what inspired the Buddha to turn around and look at his actions and views in the present moment. He got very sensitive to what was going on in the present. Moment. What does it mean to experience the present moment? Is it something you passively watch or is it something you shape? And if you shape it, can you catch yourself shaping it? What happens if you reach a point of equilibrium where there's no shaping, there's no intention at all? What does that do? Where did the Buddha see these things? Right here in the present moment, because he was very sensitive right here. And he wasn't thinking about getting to universal compassion or universal emptiness or universal equanimity or anything. He just wanted to understand the present moment, really see what was going on. And it was in seeing what was going on that made everything open up in a way that was really stable, solid, safe, and secure. Of course, it's possible to have great technicolor experiences in your meditation, but if they're not well-founded, they can actually do more harm than good. 
some of these dimensions can leave the mind really frazzled at the end of its rope. Or it can open up for the time being to certain dimensions, tune into a radio station that it's never heard before, that has some really fantastic music. But if your radio can't stay tuned to a particular station, you don't want to go there. It just flips in, flips out, and can be very disorienting. So what you want is to be really stable. It may not be as exciting as the Technicolor movies, it may not be as dramatic or glamorous, but it really delivers the goods. One of the qualities I noticed immediately when I started spending time around the Thai forest tradition, getting to know the Ajans, was that they all had their feet firmly planted on the ground. They were no-nonsense, matter. A fact, down-to-earth people. And this quality of being down-to-earth was what helped guarantee the stability and safety of the practice they were following, so that the insights they gained were not shrouded in a cloud of denial or in some never-never land. They were firmly grounded in the present moment actually, in something deeper than the present moment, but that's found in the present moment. And the quality of groundedness was their guarantee. When unusual. Things did happen in the meditation, they were grounded in their ability to gauge those events to see what was useful, and what wasn't, what was reliable, what was not. So when we're dealing with our own minds, that groundedness is the quality we want. Awakening, when it comes, is not a disorienting experience. It's the exact opposite. It makes you even more grounded, better oriented. Oriented to the deathless. And so the path to take you there has to be a grounded path as well. What this means is that we're working on a foundation. Foundation work is not necessarily glamorous work. Look here at the monastery, with all the infrastructure work that has to go down into the ground. It's very difficult to get donations for underground pipes, underground electricity systems, but it's essential. The infrastructure under the ground is what everything else is based on. It may not be glamorous, but that's what guarantees that everything else is going to work. So as we're meditating here we're working on infrastructure. And even though the people who work on infrastructure don't have the most glamorous jobs, the most sought-after social position, it's because of them that society can function. It's because of this infrastructure work that you're doing right now. This is what's going to make your meditation work. So have the pride of a craftsman, because this is the kind of work upon which everything else depends. As we draw curtains on today's session, we extend an invitation for ongoing participation. Just as Buddha advocated sharing and supporting his teachings for the greater good, we urge your involvement. Aid in spreading these profound teachings universally by subscribing, liking, and sharing. Your active role ensures these invaluable insights transcend boundaries. Seize this chance to spark positive change and nurture empathy. We eagerly await your presence in future episodes, uniting to illuminate minds and cultivate compassion worldwide.